I'm going to take attendance and um, I have a PowerPoint. We're not going to have an opportunity today to talk about the text itself. Um, I'm going to have a PowerPoint. The PowerPoint I put up on Canvas earlier today. Uh, I have a lot of information. There are a lot of slides here. It's setting the framework for uh, really for the uh, entirety of the course. So if you want to take your computers out and follow along, you can. Uh, but uh, you, you, know, you don't have to take notes, the information, well you can always take notes, but the information that are on the slides you'll have access to. Okay? So I'm going to present to us a lot of information. What I am hoping is that I have a lot of information here. What I am hoping is that I have some, uh, I have some music, uh, I have some commercials. Do I have any animation in this? I try to you know, doctor it up a little bit and make it entertaining. I hope that they work on this computer. Um, so we'll see what happens. So I want to set the terms of this course. A lot of information. The West, the literature and film of the West, and Western. So what is this all about? Oftentimes, oftentimes when we think about a Western, we can picture, and I, and I think I said this the other day, that uh, whether we're talking about folks here in this classroom, folks uh, here in the United States and all around the world, we think about cowboys, we think about gunfights, and we're going to have some images of those things to look at today. Oftentimes, the enemy of the cowboy is the Indian. That's not all the case. Sometimes uh, they are other uh, white settlers, sometimes they are Mormons, um, as in the case of uh, Riders of the Purple Sage. Uh, but I think culture in many ways has grouped Indians together all in this one category. And if we look at a map here, the first thing that we see is there's a lot of land here in the United States. And this land is varied in its topography. You have swamps in different climate in the southeast and in the south. You have eastern forests. You have places in this country that don't get snow. You have other places, like Michigan, that's going to get a lot of it on Saturday. When we think about the West, we think of it being very dry and things like that. Landscape has an effect on culture in a particular region. Okay? But often when we think about the Western, we think about the West. We think about uh, a particular area. And Indians and filmmakers are guilty of this. Uh, sometimes Indians all look the same. And they don't. So some images here of landscape, maybe eastern forest or southern swamps, or uh, in the north. Here are some images of Glacier National Park in Montana. These are all different regions, right? Black Hill Mountains in South Dakota. Uh, I think I have a slide later. The Black Hill Mountains in South Dakota uh, was a place of a, of a gold rush in the late 19th century. Has anybody been to the Black Hill Mountains in South Dakota? Yeah, a couple folks. Uh, put it on your list. It's, uh, it's a fantastic place to go. I went to a spear, uh, Spearfish a bunch of years ago to give a very exciting literary paper. And um, oftentimes when I go to a literature conference, I'll take a few days and try to do some sightseeing. And um, I went horseback riding. And I am not a horseback rider, <laughs> but I went horseback riding. And uh, me and this guy, uh, who was about 300 years old, uh, took me through the Black Hill Mountains, and we went to an abandoned gold mine that was in the side of the mountain, which was really pretty scary because he was doing his own thing. He wasn't paying any attention to me. I was pretty scared. I couldn't figure out how to get the uh, windshield wipers to work on my horse. And we were walking near the edge of this cliff for quite some distance. Then we stopped, and we climbed down some stairwell, uh, a part of a stairwell that, that was in the uh, face of the cliff, and we had lunch in an abandoned gold mine that, you can, that I would never would have seen. It was a pretty neat experience. Rocky Mountains, Colorado, different environment. The Great Plains. The first time I had been to the Great Plains, I think, was in South Dakota. And things are orientated differently. How far can you see here in Michigan? Not very far at all. There are places in the plains where you can see dozens and dozens of miles in one direction. Could you look out the window here at Lawrence Tech University and see, oh, I don't know, Bloomfield Hills, or the city of Detroit, or Warren? But there are places in the Great Plains where you have that kind of vision. Here, here where we live, with trees and things like that, we are orientated vertically. Further out west, they are orientated horizontally. You can see 
great distances with wind that oftentimes blows regularly at 40, 50 miles an hour. Here, that would be a big deal for us. Some of the plain states, regular occurrence. The southwest. Each of these different regions has, uh, they have their advantages and they have their challenges. Of course, in the southwest, one of the challenges would be water. And there is a reason why, historically, there have not been a lot of people in the southwest, right? I mean, the Navajo and the Zuni, the Hopi, a various number of Native American tribes have lived there. There's also been periods of time in American history where people have disappeared from the southwest. Why? Because there's no water, because climate does change. And every few years, if you pay attention to the news, which I hope we do, because there are a lot of things going on in the world, many of them not too good, but every few years, some uh, congressman, some statesperson from New Mexico or Arizona says, uh, we don't have any water here in Arizona or New Mexico or Nevada. We need some water. You know who has water? Michigan. How about we build a pipeline from Michigan, from one of the Great Lakes, to the southwest? This happens. Sometimes people bring up these ideas. It's important that we know because we would never want that to happen. The uh, ecosystem in Michigan is very fragile. So in terms of difference, again, oftentimes in popular culture, uh, filmmakers, and even in literary texts, Indians are all grouped together. This is just a sampling of the different Native American tribes that have lived or live, continue to live in the United States. Right? Names that we have heard before, the Sioux, living in the north part of the, uh, of the Midwest, the Pawnee, the Kiowa, the Apache, the Comanche, the Shoshone. These groups of people live in different ways. Some were semi-nomadic. Some were horse people. And we'll talk about horses here in just a moment. The Arapaho, the Cheyenne, the Seminole, the Iroquois, the Shawnee, names that we have heard. These folks, some of them are related and have similar cultural customs. Some are very different. These folks, as I said, live. Some folks live very different. These are some images. These two images <clears throat> are from the Bandelier National Monument, uh, which is uh, in New Mexico. It's about uh, three hours or so north of Albuquerque. I went there about 20 years or so ago. I was younger then. And uh, there's 160 feet of ladder. 160 feet up in the air. 20 years ago, it was no big deal. I'm like, I'm not going to die. I just ran up that ladder. No big deal, right? Two years ago, I went back, and I took my oldest son. He was a senior in high school then. And I looked at those ladders, and I was a little afraid. <laughs> I got to tell you, I was a little afraid. And he's like, come on, Dad. That's what he calls me, Dad, not Dr. Weiss. He said, come on, Dad, let's go up these ladders. And he just went right up those ladders because he's just not smart enough to realize if you fall, you're dead. Right? And I just, I followed behind, but uh, I didn't tell him I was a little afraid. A uh, little bit different than living on the Great Plains in teepees or living in the forests of the East. We're going to encounter different tribes of Native Americans. In the last of the Mohicans, we're going to encounter the Delawares and the uh, Lenny Lappies and all sorts of different tribes. By the time we get to um, Owen Wister is the Virginian. He is out west. Those are going to be different Native American tribes with different customs and different ways of life. What else are we going to encounter? Might we encounter reading a novel about the west or watching a movie about the west? We're going to encounter settlers and pioneers and military people and explorers and mountain men. And some of these folks, there's a kind of romanticism, right? Oh, you know, we're just going to leave society and go live in the wild and be a mountain man. That sounds fantastic, except when you're, you know, really hungry and there's no mires around and you want to shower, right? But we've romanticized that. And there are novels written about mountain men and their ways of life. Gold miners. Yeah, gold mining sounds really exciting, doesn't it? Does anybody watch Gold Rush? No? Nobody? That's good. Uh, you've saved yourself some time. Be, uh, do something more productive. Gold rush. You know, people are still fascinated by gold. The West, primarily in the 19th century, there were a series of gold rushes. Whether we're talking about in the Southeast, 
uh, North Carolina or in the South Georgia, a large gold rush in 1849, of course, in California. In the late 19th century, the gold rush in the Black Hill Mountains, which, by the way, the Black Hill Mountains were promised to the Sioux. It was supposed to be off the grid. The U.S. government was supposed to leave the Black Hill Mountains alone until gold was found. And then when gold was discovered, well, you know, uh, Sioux people, you, you were supposed to have the Black Hill Mountains. Well, there's, this some, there's a little bit of a problem here, right? Gold was found. In the Klondike in Alaska in the 1890s, and if you watch Gold Rush, again, there's other things that are more productive to do. People are still mining in some of these places in Alaska. Gold mining is also very destructive. You know, oftentimes we, in novels and in movies, we romanticize gold mining, right? You can go to places in the West right now and you can pay some, I don't know, $30, $40 and they'll let you sit in some stream with a pan, right? And, uh, you know, most of the time people say, I'm going to just sit here and pan for gold. Or I can drop 100 bucks and just buy a flake of gold from the gift shop, right? Well, this kind of gold mining is very destructive, right? is very destructive. It strips the earth, it changes the environment, it alters the ecosystem. Those things, uh, for the most part, were not a concern for gold miners. We're going to encounter gamblers. Are there gamblers in some of the texts that we might read? Well, in Cormac McCarthy's All the Pretty Horses, there are several really intense games of chess, which is a kind of gambling. But there's a whole host of characters that we may encounter and that you would encounter reading other literary texts and watching other movies. Gamblers, people are fascinated by gamblers, right? They're free from society and everybody at a poker table is equal. Gambling is also a kind of test for something much more serious, like the gunfight, right? Do you have the kind of stamina? Do you have the performative skills not to give your hand away, especially if it's poor, right? And you can sort of picture in movies uh, them moving in on people's faces and people's eyes as they look around the table. Can they contain one's emotions? Well, we're going to see in Owen Wister's The Virginian, the Virginian, as this quintessential cowboy hero, contains his emotions. We're going to encounter, perhaps, in this genre, land speculators, and of course, gunfighters, and outlaws, and these are the stuff of American imagination. This gives us the drama. We're going to encounter prostitutes. And prostitutes have uh, a role in the history of the West, often, of course, a very unfortunate history, where people that owned prostitutes would travel from mining camp to mining camp with them. Okay. There are, uh, and there's been some histories written about prostitutes in the 19th century. There were a few madams that actually made a lot of money, but by having brothels, by employing women. We may encounter the other, folks of Asian or Chinese descent, Irish and African Americans. The West had a lot of people in it, believe it or not. Okay. If we're thinking about railroads and the Intercontinental uh, Railroad was connected in 1869, part of Irish history, part of Chinese history might be concerned or involve the laying of those railroad ties. And of course, we're going to have cowboys, right? The cowboy has become a national symbol. Many different names for the cowboy, a cowman, a cowhand, a Van Kiro, a cowpuncher, herders, waddies. What was a cowboy, though? This is really what is curious about the Western and how it has evolved in its popularity as symbol for America in many ways. A cowboy was a, a wage earner, a really on the lowest ladder. He lived a very difficult life. He was dirty. He went on long uh, you know, long ranges with cattle. He rode a horse. This was not uh, a glorious job. If you were a cowboy, you are, or you were at the sort of lower end of the socioeconomic ladder. You just sort of punched in. Essentially, the cowboy was a common laborer. And yet, 
in our culture, the cowboy, through literature and film, has become a symbol of America. So he was dirty, overworked, uh, their laborers in the cattle industry, branded calves, cattle drives, mended fences, broken horses. Originally in the 19th century, in the early 19th century, uh, being labeled a cowboy was a pejorative term because you were just a common laborer. Cowboys were ethnically diverse. And yet, curiously, uh, we often find cowboys in our novels and in film as white only. Some images of frontier life and progress. The image in the upper right hand corner, does anybody know what that is? Yeah. It's a mud house. It's a, it's a sod house, right? I mean, if you're going to the Great Plains and you need to build yourself a house and there are no trees, it's not exactly like you can go to Home Depot, right? So they cut pieces of sod and lay them like brick, and now you have a sod house. The story of the West is, in some ways, the story about dirt. And this is what we you know, sort of don't get in, in much of our popular culture. It's a story about dirt and bad odors and illness, and things like that. Well, can you imagine how comfortable a sod house might be? Right? I mean, some of us don't even want to walk across our hardwood floors without slippers, right? Let alone walking across a dirt floor with sod as our walls, and if you look too closely at them, there's probably some worms and bugs moving around. And if the mice uh, are running around, don't get too worried about that either. These are the conditions that people lived in. We'll talk about hangings. There's an important hanging that happens offstage in Worcester as the Virginian. Deadwood, South Dakota, Dodge City, Kansas. These are places where there was a lot of action in the 19th century. And you, and you can go to these places now. Now, Deadwood, South Dakota, there's some okay restaurants. You can stay there in a hotel, a whole lot of gift shops. You can buy yourself a whole lot of tchotchkes pertaining to the West and plaques, tin plaques uh, that have to do with gunfighters and things like that. The horse. I don't know if I have another slide coming up, so uh, I'll make some comments about the horse. When we think about the horse, we think about, uh, well, when we think about cowboys, we think about the horse. Uh, they are one and the same. A horse was really important for a cowboy. It is how a person got from one point to another. And the relationship that often developed between a horse and a cowboy was very close. And this is going to be seen, or at least imagined, in the literature. We're going to see this between uh, Pedro and Monty in uh, The Virginian. We're going to see this with John Grady Cole and his horse. There are a number of Native American tribes, particularly the Great Plains tribes, the Pawnee, the Sioux, the Comanche in the south, the Apache, were horse people. The horse actually died out. There was an American horse that was native to the United States. It died out in the late Pleistocene, somewhere around 10,000 years before the present. There were no more horses. In fact, there were actually no uh, beasts of burden until contact with the Europeans. There was no cattle, no donkeys, no mules, nothing like that. Um, the Spanish brought horses with them. And of course, horses escaped, and they made their way onto the Great Plains. And all of these different uh, Native American groups adopted the horse. And it transformed their way of life, transformed. Now you could travel greater distances. You could follow buffalo herds and all sorts of different things. So when we think about the cowboy and the horse and, and uh, Native Americans and the horse, it hasn't always been the case. The horse uh, came here essentially in uh, sometime in the middle of the 16th century, early 16th century, okay? Transformed everybody that was here. Buffalo, part of the story of America, part of the story of the West. Okay? This is an image um, from, I think this is from the 1990s, Kevin Costner's uh, Dances with Wolves, and I think it does a, a good job. Uh, they're coming over a rise in a hill. They're, he's with this Native American tribe. He hears the buffalo. Uh, they're there to hunt buffalo. They come over a rise, and they see all of these dead carcasses of buffalo. Why are those buffalo dead? Well, obviously, because somebody killed them. Why are they there rotting? because buffalo hunters were only interested in the skins of the buffalo. In 1872, scholars 
believe, they put a number of about two point, between 1872 and 1874, about 2.1 million buffalo were killed in the Great Plains. Scholars believe that about 250,000 of those buffalo were killed by Native Americans. The rest were killed by white buffalo hunters. And white buffalo hunters, unlike Native Americans, they just wanted, for the most part, the skin. Native Americans would take, they would eat the buffalo. They'd use the skin. They'd use uh, the muscle. Or, well, they'd eat the muscle. They would use uh, tendons and cartilage and whatever they could use, bones to make tools, right? White buffalo hunters did not. They took the skins and left the carcasses to rot, okay? Where do we start to see this way of life in the 19th century? And really, the 19th century is the place where the idea of the West and the frontier, just as these things began to disappear, they were embraced and imagined in popular culture. The Western and its literature, a set of problems in endless combination, the problem of progress, honor, vengeance, and social control, Violence, these are things that we would encounter in the West, in the Western. It's value and control. What does it mean? What it means to be a man. The Western novel, the Western film is often preoccupied about the idea of masculinity. What constitutes being a man? The West as, a, uh, the West as opposed to, or is opposed to, an unjust world, often in opposition to the East. Um, the Beetle Dime Novel of the 1860s, this was actually not the first dime novel. The dime novel developed in the late 1830s by Ann Stephen. Uh, Ann Stephen, she wrote a novel called Malaska, which was uh, popular in 1839. It was published in a magazine, and then it was reprinted in the 1860s. These were cheap uh, penny or nickel or dime novels that were printed uh, very cheaply on cheap paper. And these were stories of cowboys and Indians. They also had detective stories and spy thrillers and all sorts of things. But these sorts of novels in the middle of the 19th, middle uh, to the 19th, uh, excuse me, middle of the 19th to late 19th century were disseminated all throughout the country. You wanted to read about cowboys and Indians? Now you were able to. People were writing novels about them. We're going to concentrate also on landscape. And landscape, the meaning of landscape has changed from the 19th century to the 21st century when we're talking about the novel of the West or in film. Landscape is a place of renewal or transformation. It's a release, including the West here, the release from the constraints of urban society. This quote is from Lee Clark Mitchell, that the West was an escape valve for Western tensions and psychological pressures. The West is, uh, the West is about the myth of America to create and affirm ideas and problems of American identity and history. These are some of the larger issues that we're going to be tackling. Relationship between history and myth. Well, we're already sort of, even in these brief comments already, we're already thinking about the difference between history and myth. There's a history of the cowboy, and now we're seeing, and we're going to see, the myth of the cowboy and that transformation that takes place. So we have in every generation, in each generation, there is a new rendition, a new version of the Western. Some Westerns are reformulated from old Westerns. Some Westerns add new voices, try to do different things. Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian in 1985 was one of those moments in the novel of the West or the Western because this was very different. It's centered on the Glanton Gang. The Glanton Gang was an historical group uh, so they did exist in history. This was an extremely violent novel. This is about a group of people that essentially traveled throughout the Southwest killing Native Americans to gather bounties. Maybe this was revisionist history. Maybe this didn't happen at all. A lot, lot of scholarship, including my own, has focused on Blood Meridian. The literary cowboy figure. You see a few images here, I think, of um, Clint Eastwood. The literary cowboy figure represented a nostalgic dream of escape from middle class obligations and in particular family ties and this idea of just passing through. Part of this fantasy, perhaps a fantasy that some of us engage in, 
although you folks are going to graduate, Lawrence, many of you are going to graduate, Lawrence soon, you are fantasizing about getting a nice job with a big paycheck. Well, if you think about when you started, Lawrence, some of you fantasize about just leaving and just going somewhere else and finding yourself a nice place to take a nap and when you wake up to just look at clouds. That's what the cowboy represented. The East was a busy place. Philadelphia, New York, Boston. It had rules and regulations. And some people said, I don't want to live here anymore. This is too constraining. I'm going out West. Not so many rules, right? The Western and various mediums, comic books, and this is all of the different places and genres and mediums that we would encounter the West, right? And comic books. I've read some of those, they're pretty good. Um, in figures, these are uh, the image in the upper left hand corner, Mago figures uh, from the 1970s. This was a picture, I think actually I took it, uh, in, from Myers in 2009, toys. Uh, that have a Western theme to them. Johnny West figures, Legos, Toy Story, video games, the Oregon Trail on display at the Henry Ford Museum in the 1980s showcase. And you know what's really sad about that? When I went there a couple of years ago, I saw all my toys in the 1980s and the 1970s showcase. They're in a museum. That made me a little bit sad, right? Okay. Uh, Red Dead Redemption. Has anybody, uh, has anybody played that game before? Have you? I guess they're coming out with uh, finally Red Dead, uh, Red, right? Red Dead Redemption 2. Did, oh, did it? See, I'm already a year late. But uh, anyway, I don't have time for video games. I have too many papers to grade. Um, I'm just going to highlight a couple of things that if you were to make a list of what you know before taking this class about the Western, that you would be familiar with. And one of those things would be that we see in Western after Western, whether a literary text, a pop novel, a dime novel, or in a movie. We're going to watch some of this if I can get it to work. Come on. This is from the mid-1980s uh, Pale Rider. The music, the positioning of the gunfighters. And the way with which this scene is constructed is a way that, as a viewer, we would come to expect when we see a gunfight in a Western. There's a, a comfort in its familiarity. some other portions here to look at. Um, clothing. Clothing is very important for the Western in both literature and film. Why is clothing important? Well, oftentimes, 
because there is a moral ambiguity of the characters, particularly when we come to a film uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, The Wild Bunch, where it becomes confusing to tell who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. Clothing often dictates, and audiences would be aware of this based on clothing, who those characters are and what they're supposed to do, right? Clothing, of course, is very important for the cowboy. Why did the cowboy wear a vest? Does anybody know? Anybody try to get a piece of gum out of their pocket while they're driving a car? It's a little bit difficult, right? Because you're sitting. Well, if you had a vest, you could put that piece of gum right in your vest pocket. That's where a vest comes from, right? Now, in the 19th century, it wouldn't be a piece of gum. It'd probably be a cigarette or something like that, right? But clothing identifies a cowboy. Clothing would identify, here this is an image from uh, John Wayne's The Searchers that we're going to see. Clothing identifies the damsel in distress. We know that this particular woman who's dressed in this particular way might be the woman that needs to be rescued. We know that those are bartenders. They have a certain function to fulfill in the Western. We can identify them. There's no confusion there. There has to be some elements of the Western that we're familiar with, that we're comfortable with, because morally, there's going to be some ambiguity. What kind of ambiguity might there be? Well, this image is from a movie. It was pretty awful. It was called Bad Girls from 1994. These women are kind of gunfighters. Well, wait a second. I, think a woman was, I thought a woman was supposed to be a damsel in distress. They needed to be rescued. Well, in this film, they were gunfighters. They were dressed as gunfighters. Uh, Godless, a Netflix maxi series. I think it was seven episodes long. If you haven't seen it, write it down. It's fantastic. Clothing here identifies these women as heroic, as heroes. So clothing helps identify the function of a character in a movie or in a text. Okay? Music. Let's see if I can get this to play without... No, it's not going to work. This was, come on, you can do it. We're hardly going to talk about, just a little bit, we're going to talk about music in the Western. Music has a really important role. Uh, music scores help focus a particular scene. They help raise tension. They do all sorts of different things. The Searchers is considered one of the, uh, one of the greatest Westerns ever written. This is from Rio Bravo. Let's see if I can get this music to play. Yeah, from Rio Bravo, 1959. Music allows people, cowboys here, to bond together. And if you didn't know the words, and you're sitting all together with your, uh, with your besties out on the range, then we all whistle together, right? We're sort of sitting around the fire and drinking. I was whistling this earlier. I won't do it right now. His rifle, his pony, and me. I mean, what better fantasy is there? There is none, right? Sort of escape the world of the East and ride the range. All right, let me see what else we have. Of course, movies. We've been talking about movies uh, all along here. <clears throat> we have Western novels to movie adaptations. Uh, we're going to watch portions of The Virginian, which is, uh, to me, very unsatisfying. Bill Pullman is an awful Virginian who's supposed to be tiger-like and lithe and can whip his lasso like a snake, uh, as we're going to see in, in, um, in the novel. Lonesome Dove was a set of novels that was made into a movie. Last of the Mohicans, you're reading that, by the way. And we're going to watch portions of it. Uh, we're going to watch portions from the movie, and, and it's sort of interesting. You know, I've been to these literary conferences, these literature conferences, and people get pretty upset about 
movie adaptations that come from literary texts. And I sat in a panel discussion, and, and actually, even for me, I thought I was sort of like in the twilight zone, but they were fighting over this. The Last of the Mohicans is not true to James Fenimore Cooper's novel. I agree with that. It's not. There are parts of it that are not even close, but it's a pretty good movie. And there are portions of it that we're going to watch uh, once, so you don't have to hear me talk the entire time. And uh, they'll help us make sense, I think, of some things. People get pretty, pretty hot about it. The Western has infiltrated various genres. The Empire Strikes Back. Has anyone seen that movie before? Okay, it's the best, write this down, it's the best Star Wars movie ever made. Nothing beats the Tauntauns at the beginning of that movie. Um, Cowboys and Aliens, 2011, uh, cross genres. An episode from Star Trek The Next Generation. Death Wish from the 1970s. Scholars have said Charles Bronson is a cowboy-like figure, a gunfighter figure. Conan the Barbarian. Some scholars have said Conan the Barbarian is a Western figure. What scholar has said that? Actually, I did. Uh, and I was runner-up for, uh, I had an article published about six years ago in an anthology uh, about how Conan the Barbarian is a Western, uh, Western hero. Uh, Conan the Barbarian uh, was a figure in the pulp 30s, written by, actually the pulp 20s, written by Robert E. Howard in the late 1920s, about 1931 before he shot himself. And um, the, the essay actually was a runner-up for, uh, for an award from the Robert E. Howard Foundation. Rango. Has anyone seen Rango? No? Uh, yes. Okay. Some of us, there's some hope for us. Let me see. If, there's just a little... A little bit of music here. That's it. I just wanted to play that part for you. Okay. Um, come on, switch back over. I'm really taxing the system at LTU, I know. I'm pushing my luck. And body art. Right? I mean, people get tattoos for all sorts of different things. These tattoos, to me, look... Uh, Impressive and painful and expensive. Here we have an image of Clint Eastwood. That is a, looks to be a very expensive back tattoo of a, of a Western scene, a wanted poster perhaps, a damsel in distress, all sorts of different things. And of course, we have commercials. Now, you don't have to be a scholar of the West that all sorts of different commercials are created with a Western theme. And we identify with it. We understand its elements. Let me see if I can get a couple of these to play. Still doesn't want to do that. We'll watch just a couple. One of them, I think, is pretty funny. You know, a lot of these are cliches now, right? The villain wearing a black hat. We just saw that scene in the gunfight with uh, the Pale Rider, the woman sort of looking out the window and ducking back in. And we saw that here in this... Uh, Candy bar commercial. Yay, the Western, Milky Way. All right, let's see what this one is. I have a couple here to show you. No. Come on. A Burger King commercial. Sort of a western theme music, western theme burger. I don't know anything about Burger King. I suppose that guy dancing is Burger King. I mean, I'm not really even certain. <clears throat> we have the same sort of tropes in this Burger King commercial that we'd be familiar with. What is this one?
Oh, this is a Budweiser commercial. <coughs> this wasn't that long ago. Tension, the reaching for the gun, uh, the close-ups on their faces. That's a pretty good commercial, right? And this is going to play on this is going to play on something that we're going to encounter in um, in the Virginian, right? The the saloon is full of people, and people are there's music playing and people are talking and gambling, and then the saloon doors open, and then the music stops and everyone freezes, right? That's that sort of trope that is being played with uh, in this commercial. So we also have reenactment and parody. Uh, reenactment in Tucson, Arizona of the gunfight. Uh, parody, Blazing Saddles, early 1970s. Uh, we have uh, in comics, not only in comic books, but in comic strips, right? High noon at the OK staff meeting, you know? Uh, so we see this in popular culture. And just for a moment, I'm going to think about, I think we should think about the West today. Because in popular culture, in film, and in literature, we're going to get a very sanitized, in some ways, a very sanitized uh, set of elements that are going to describe for us and that we're going to reinforce in the popular American imagination. But the West is a very complicated place. I started off uh, the slide presentation by talking about the diversity of Native American cultures. I didn't even talk about the diversity of Native American languages, hundreds of them. Okay. The West today is a very complicated place. Um, one of my favorite shows, I think I've already made an allusion to it, uh, day one, uh, Breaking Bad. Uh, there is a reason why Breaking Bad, uh, the TV show, took place in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Why is that? Because Albuquerque, like a lot of cities in this country, have a drug problem. And in Albuquerque, New Mexico, it, it's opiates, it's methamphetamines, it's all sorts of things. Again, the West is a complicated place. Um, it has fast food restaurants, fast food chains, uh, much like a lot of the country. And so we think of the West, we romanticize it, and you go, you know what, I'm going to go out West, I'm going to sightsee, I'm going to be a tourist, eh, I think I'll just stop and have some Burger King, right? Food is sort of all the same in many ways. There are fights over land rights, fights between ranchers and the federal government, uh, fights between folks that want to uh, use trees for lumber and folks that want to maintain ecosystems and leave them open for future generations, untouched, if you will, so that folks like us can go there and visit, which in these national parks, by the way, you can't go and visit. Uh, the government is shut down. This is an image here of Devil's Monument. That's not my image, but actually on the same trip that I was in uh, Spearfish, I traveled into Wyoming, and it was great. It was three hours on the road in Wyoming, and I did not see another car. But I began to get hungry. Uh, and also what was great about it, there was no cell service, which I really enjoyed. But I started to get hungry, and this was... Uh, whatever year it was, it was in October, end of October. No cars, just driving through the open country. And I came to this place, and it was near Devil's Monument, and um, it was like three buildings together that was sort of made to look like an old western town. Hadn't come across anything in hours. So I saw one light on. Uh, it was sort of in the back of this building. Um, the place wasn't open, there were no cars. I'm not usually like this, but I was kind of hungry. So this was like a, probably in the summer months, a saloon, a restaurant. So I went up to the front door of, this, uh, of the establishment, and it was open. So I just walked in and uh, made my way to the back. And I'm like, hello, is anybody here? 
I'm starting to get, I think I'm like in a horror movie. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm not that hungry, right? And so I go, and this guy, he had to have been about nine feet tall. I am not certain if he had showered since the last tourist left uh, in the summer. And he said, oh, you're hungry? And he was one of the nicest guys I've ever met. He goes, I'll tell you what, you go sit down. I'll start a fire for you. What would you like to eat? He goes, I got some buffalo ribs and some mashed potatoes and some bread and I'll heat them all up and cook them all up for you. One of the best meals I've ever had. Um, I was a little concerned about ever leaving that place, but I made it out just fine, right? This is a place about uh, oil, right? The West is about oil. I have a friend, more or less, believe it or not, um, and she lives in Williston, North Dakota. This is oil country. This is uh, the Bakken Oil Plateau. Oil folks are having a hard time right now because the cost of a barrel of oil has, uh, it's good for us because gas is only $2.15 a gallon, but when it reaches a certain level, uh, it's like at $45 a barrel, I think, it becomes a losing proposition. Williston, uh, North Dakota, which is near the Canadian border, um, was oil booming. Uh, it was very expensive to live there. In fact, this was very 19th century west. Uh, very expensive to live there. Um, actually, if you wanted to work at Walmart, you can go to a Walmart and work in Williston, North Dakota, and you might make $20 an hour. $20 an hour. You want a one-bedroom apartment, you might pay $2,000 a month. There's not enough housing there. So it's, it, it's a different world. I talk to this person uh, a few times a year, and, and it's like, it's like uh, out of the 19th century. Water is a problem. I talked to you a little while ago uh, about water in the Southwest. Actually, water is a problem all throughout this country, not only in Flint, Michigan, not only in several areas uh, in Illinois and northern Indiana, but in all sorts of places all over this country. Uh, there are lakes in California and in Nevada and in Arizona where the lake water levels are dropping and disappearing. Okay? Climate does change. Last slide here. I think this is, um, this is a brothel. In the upper left-hand corner, they're uh, in Nevada. Now, some people think that, oh, you go to Las Vegas, prostitution's legal. Well, you're going to get yourself into some trouble. It's not legal in Las Vegas, right? But this is part of the complexity of the West. The West is, when we think about the West and the Western, a diverse environment culturally in terms of landscape. And, of course, this is very much in the forefront, or it should be, of our thinking. Arizona, New Mexico, these are border, Texas, these are border states, right? In a different moments in time in history, the national borders have changed. You know, the West is about thinking about immigration. In fact, in Cormac McCarthy's All the Pretty Horses, John Grady Cole is going to be unhappy with America. And he is going to become a kind of immigrant. He's going to leave America and go south instead of the other way around. Again, part of the complexity here of the West. Okay, so why don't we stop there uh, for today. Uh, this, uh, the PowerPoint, uh, as I said, is up on Canvas, if I have loaded it correctly. Somebody can let me know if you can see it.